It is noon. We are post Labor Day, and I'm very excited to introduce you to Dr. Deborah Clary. Today, we are going to have an interesting conversation on the topic of leadership, which, as you know, is a topic that really winds my clock. But we're going to come at it from another thing that really winds my clock, which is curiosity. As a recovering journalist, curiosity is the way that I really lead a lot of the conversations that I have with women leaders today. And I'm so excited to be in front of Dr. Deborah Clary, who is AVP at Humana. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you. Um, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about all the other major titles that you've held in your in your career history, uh, many other Fortune 100 companies. List a couple of us just to set up the exposition here. Um, so I spent a decade at uh, Frito-Lay in, in sales and marketing and operations. I spent almost a decade there. Then I spent a decade at Coca-Cola. And then I turned to the hard stuff and went to Brown Foreman, the makers of, uh, of uh, Jack Daniels, was I, I was the VP of strategy. Uh, I was on the wine side, so I spent a lot of time out at Napa Valley, which was a really tough gig to have to have to do. And when uh, I was there, I got really interested in leadership and culture and just beginning to see differences in different uh, companies that I had worked for. And so I decided to go back and get a doctorate in leader development and org design. So I worked full time. I went to school full time. Uh, and then after I graduated, I wrote my dissertation and turned it into a book on women in leadership. Uh, Humana was just beginning to start uh, a leadership institute. And they said, gosh, with your background, your business background and your academic background, you would be perfect to stand up this institute. And of course, I said, like, no way. Right. <laughs> I'm not I'm food and beverage. I don't know anything about healthcare. Uh, but they convinced me to do so. And I'm so glad that they did. And it's just been um, it's just been a pleasure to work here to, to develop leaders and, and, and really help advance the culture. And that's really the thing, though, right? Like the elixir that we're about to talk about, curiosity, that transcends regardless of the vertical that you're functioning in. That leadership, uh, that leadership skill set transcends and goes with you to whatever role you go to. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk about curiosity. Although I got to say, I'm curious, what bourbon is your fancy these days? Oh, my goodness. Um, it's hard to pick because there are so many of them. Um, but my everyday drinkable bourbon is um, Woodford Reserve Double Oak. It's okay. very drinkable. <laughs> yes. Amazing. I'm a, I'm a scotch drinker myself. I've just been educating myself on bourbon, but I'm a big Isla region, peaty, mossy whiskey drinker. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good stuff. All right, let's talk about curiosity. Like, what is it of all the different facets of leadership that you've been involved in? Um, what is it about curiosity that really winds your clock? You know, what I, I got really uh, curious uh, and interested in curiosity the last couple of years when I began to see the number of people that were leaving the workforce, particularly women. I mean, there were uh, 4 million Americans that left their job a couple months ago alone in one month. And, you know, the great resignation, I think, is better called the great awakening. I think employees are waking up and saying, I want to be valued. I want to be seen. I want my voice to be heard. And as I began to think about that, I it occurred to me that the way leaders behave could significantly shift the way uh, what what employees were feeling and how they were coming to work every day. And it became my hypothesis that some leaders just become incurious because we know that employees don't leave companies, they leave leaders. And when leaders become incurious and they stop what might appear as caring is I think when employees are saying, I think I might just stop this. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I remember interviewing uh, an expert on company culture and he said, you know, I'm not a fan anymore of the annual review. I think that's been traded in in favor of the monthly coaching call where we are co-creating this trajectory that you're on employee and boss. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Someone once asked me, you know, what what makes a great leader? And it's like, gosh, you know, there are just thousands of books about leadership and I studied it. Um, but for me, if I have to come down to one thing, it's the leaders that care are the greatest leaders. And part of that caring is also having some curiosity about what's going on with your employees. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which, which is about asking questions and really understanding your associate, your, your employee. 
We use the word elixir. The secret elixir to great leadership is curiosity. I want to talk about why that word choice before we get into your six tips. I, I, I chose that title because I, I felt as though if leaders heard the word, you know, that curiosity was a way to, uh, you know, increase productivity, uh, decrease retention, help it with development. I kind of thought they would say, I don't think so, right? Similar to what Gallup did, you know, a few decades ago when they started talking about engagement. And so I wanted to express that it really is kind of this, it's this ingredient that could have significant impact um, if leaders started using it. Mm -hmm. I want to invite those who, who are uh, tuning into our conversation with Dr. Deborah Clary today to please put your questions in the chat and I will ask them at the end. All right, let's get into your top six tips. Number one is why is curiosity good for our brains? I'm spending a lot of time nowadays, Deborah, in the study of the three different human brains and how they work together and how they work disparately to help us get our goals. But why is curiosity good for our brains? Yes. Yeah, so um, I... I come at things from first from a scientific perspective, you know, in a, in a uh, objective way, if you will. So for me to even go down this path of curiosity, I wanted to know the science behind it. And so I did significant amount of, of research and a couple of really cool studies came out, one um, by a group of neuroscientists in London, and they did a study of the brain. They, they put students into an fMRI machine. Now, if you've been to London, and I suspect that you have have mm -hmm. is that people, particularly students, will spend a disproportionate amount of their time in pubs playing trivia. <laughs> so they, they, they gathered these students that like to play uh, the trivia. They put them in uh, this machine. And what they discovered is that there are two parts of the brain that just light up when we're curious. And the first is called the, the midbrain. Now, the midbrain is important because it, it controls all our senses, our sight, our hearing, our taste, our temperature, and our arousal. Mm -hmm. Now, the other part of the brain that really lit up was the, um, the nucleus. Now, the nucleus is important because it really is the command center for all of our cognitive processing. So mm -hmm. you can see these two parts of the brain are really important for our day-to-day -day living on that. So they found that they lit up, but what they also discovered was that the midbrain, it just gets so excited about new information that's coming in is that it recruits the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is important because it manages and stores memory or what I would call learning. Mm -hmm. And so if we want to anchor learning, we can do so um, by engaging the brain in that way. Uh, so it's extremely um, good for our brain to be curious. Now let's tie this back into leadership. When you're engaging those two major parts of your brain, apply that to a scenario where you are coaching an, an employee and maybe they're a B player and you need them to become an A player. Yep. So in, in my experience, what I have found is, you know, typically leaders get elevated in their organization because they were competent in what they, what they're doing. Right. So they were capable probably at doing that role that they've been promoted out of. Mm -hmm. And so typically what happens is an employee comes into a leader's office and they sit the set, they sit the problem on the table. So here in front of the employee and the leader is the problem. Mm -hmm. And what leaders will do because they're pressed for time, they have constraints and plus they know it all is they solve the problem on behalf of the employee. Mm -hmm. They say, I want you to do X, Y, and Z. And then they send them on their way. But a more effective leader will ask questions that leads that employee to think for themselves. Mm -hmm. And then most likely they have the answer if the leader will continue to ask them questions about, you know, how long have you been thinking about this? What are some of the solutions that you might have? And what that is doing is sparking curiosity in the employee. And what it's also doing is for the employee, it's saying, wow, I'm important. He's, he or she is actually listening to my ideas. So that is the, you know, the, the one way that leaders can be more effective and have greater impact and increase you know, the development of that employee. 
And what I'm hearing you say is that when you just jump in and do the task for them, or you authoritatively say, I want you to do X, Y, and Z, you're actually robbing them of critical problem solving skills, mm -hmm. things that they're going to need to do a better job at their current role down the line to become the A player that to become the A player that you want. So really going down the seven whys and keep asking why and peeling back the onion is the curiosity that you're talking about in order to be able to have them arrive at their own conclusion. Yeah, abs absolutely. Um, Accenture did a study not too long ago where they shared that uh, that um, that people. Let me start again. That so um, development is a greater predictor of one's retention in an organization versus promotion and um, uh, money. Meaning that if individuals feel like they're being developed and that they're growing, you know, that growth mindset and that that I'm going to be a part of this organization because they believe in me, that's a greater predictive of, of retention than anything else. And said another way, you can hear it, you can read it, but for you to actually do it is what increases the retention too. It's that, that sort of tactical kinetic sort of thing that happens when you're actually in it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I suspect I know what the top killer of curiosity is in most people's world nowadays, given the post COVID conversation, which is burnout. But what do you think is the top killer of curiosity? So hear me out before you judge me, uh, but it, it starts with our parents and our teachers. So when we are young, we are taught um, that, you know, curiosity killed the cat. Mm -hmm. you know, Adam and Eve ate of the, the, the tree of knowledge and they were cast out upon the world. Um, Pandora's box, please don't open Pandora's box. So we are, we are taught um, that curiosity is not a good thing. Um, and there was another group of neuroscientists that did a study with children wanting to understand cognitive development. And what they discovered is, and it's not surprising for people that have toddlers right now, is that they'll ask 396 questions a day. Mm. Um, and what they found in this longitudinal study is that uh, um, if the parent or the caregiver tried to answer, uh, you know, stay in the conversation, you know, like, why, why is this happening? Why is this happening? And as a parent or a caregiver, you may not know, but if you stay in it with them and try to solve it with them, what they discovered in this study is that those children were more academic, academically successful, more socially connected and more emotionally stable. Um, so it's, it, if we can start our start off right in life in terms of being encouraged to be curiosity. I mean, that really helps. Um, now, here's another interesting piece, and I'm going to go on to my other point of this, is that what they also found out is 85% of the time that a child asks a question, who does he ask? The mother. The mother. <laughs> right, go ask your mother, right? Um, so the other point of this is that um, curiosity is a state and not a trait, meaning we think we're born with curiosity. Maybe other people are, oh, wow, they're born curious. It's not, we're all born curious, but we're, it's taken away from us because we're to be seen and not heard, or we have to follow a structure. And hey, as parents and caregivers, we're doing the best we can. And as teachers, we're doing the best that we can. But there is another way, you know, to, to come after that. So knowing that it is a it's a, a state and not a trait and it can be it can be fostered. So when you see the apathy start to kick in, the eyes are glazing over uh, in the workplace. So how do you how do you kind of stop short circuit that that boredom that I don't know if my place is here anymore? I'm out the door. How can curiosity be stoked again? It, it's about asking those questions in a really genuine way. You know, you you brought up the point about um, you know that uh, performance, you know, annual performance reviews really are a thing of the past. It is about that continuous connection, you know, weekly or monthly when you're when you're talking with your employee, and it's asking them questions around, you know, how are you feeling about things. Um, you know, what is it that we can work on together that would inspire you? Uh, what is it that you still want to learn? You know, getting, asking those genuine questions um, that can together that you can work something through. 
When you're seeing that eyes glaze over, look, you see that that person's checked out. Um, asking questions is certainly one way, but what's another, I mean, you, this isn't your first rodeo. You've been at this for a while. What's another thing that's been effective that you've seen work in your career? Well, I think the, uh, you know, the one thing is the asking of the question and then the, the listening is the most important thing, right? So when somebody is speaking, you're listening. And there is the, also the nonverbal, you know, picking up on what people might be feeling, but they're not wanting to express, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and it gets down to um, the piece around caring. If your employee knows that you or your colleague or your boss, they know that you genuinely care and you're caring not because you're trying to increase uh, performance for the organization, but you're caring for them first as an individual and mm -hmm. that it's your well-being is important to me. You know, your balance in life is important to me. Let's let's talk about how how we can work that through. So care paired with that curiosity can be a top killer to a top stoker of curia of, of getting that person back in. Yeah, and I'll add another C there um, is around courage. So leaders often don't want to have that conversation. Um, they don't want someone to feel bad, or maybe they don't even want to know what's going on with them because it might force another decision on that. But you know, courageous leaders are, you know, the the, the ability to and the willingness to to have those meaningful conversations, even though they might be difficult, is really important. Mm -hmm. Encourage on the part of the employee probably to also articulate what they need and be their own best advocate. Absolutely. And that all comes down to trust, you know, building trusting relationships. I want to encourage anybody who's tuning into this conversation to please put your questions in the chat. And uh, Deborah and I are going to definitely address them at the end of end of our six points here. All right. Point number three. How do top leaders harness curiosity and have that as one of their powerful arrows in their quiver? Yeah. And I, I would love to call this the it's a culture of curiosity. Right. It's it's having an entire organization um, recognize that curiosity is really critical because curiosity feeds innovation. Uh, it, 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 it fuels engagement. It can fuels, you know, productivity, if you will. Um, but it's, it's having a, a senior leader, senior leaders, if you will, really embrace the values of the organization and the culture. And a part of that culture is um, your voice matters. And in order for me to hear your voice, I need to be curious and I need to be asking questions. And it's so the, how to harness it. If somebody asks a question in a in a meeting is how does the leader address it? You know, do, do they affirm the individual do, and do they go on and brainstorm around that or do they shut it down? So shutting it down obviously is not a good thing, but the opportunity to say, let's explore that or I haven't thought about that. And to be able to role model that speaking up and having ideas is really important to our culture. What's another way before we leave this, this button? I think it's one about being vulnerable as a leader meaning that if you don't have the answer and we're hoping that leaders don't have all the answers, right? We want, we want leaders that are continuously learning and, um, and doing, if you will. And so I think it's one about as a leader to say, I don't know the answer to this. Um, I'd like the group to, to brainstorm around this and just mm -hmm. so being vulnerable that I don't have all the answers, but collectively, I think we can get to a good place. Yeah. And being very intentional about creating time and white space for those conversations to actually happen. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. How to make curiosity contagious. We all know people that kind of go through life and are not curious about anything. I know a few of them. So how do we how do we make our own curiosity contagious in the workplace? Yeah. And I'm actually going to quote you, but you were quoting someone else on one of your other podcasts about, you know, you, you, in five years, you're going to be the, the, the person you are with the exception of the people you meet and the books that you read by mm -hmm. a guy named um, uh, Charlie, I forget the last name at the moment, but um, mm -hmm. that's really powerful. Right. And so in terms of curiosity is contagious, as I shared that study with the children um, is that um, it is a state and not a trait. And when you're around curious people, 
you become more curious. I mean, think about how much fun it is when you go out to drinks with colleagues or friends and you're just asking all kinds of questions about something that's happening in the world. Or you've come back from your Morocco trip and you know people want to learn about that. That is so much more fun than being at a table where people are not that way. Mm -hmm. So it's um, for from a leader's perspective, if you are modeling being curious, then you're going to set the culture within your team and it is contagious. Well, you know, the, the point that we just left the last one with is how do you create white space for that? We're so busy. We're trying to do way more with way less resources. How do we create the space for this kind of this brand of conversation to happen? Yeah, I, I think it's you have to be super intentional and you have to have the this growth mindset to say, how can I get the best performance from my team and from myself and from individuals? And it's thinking about that mindset when you're going into a conversation or when you're going into your um, a team meeting, if you will, and you're leading that, it is about um, setting the intention of everyone matters, everyone has great ideas, and that together we can certainly make a difference here. Yeah. You know, I was having a conversation with one of my members two weeks ago, and she was talking about this woman who was being promoted, but she was really sabotaging any of the new hires that were being onboarded to take over her job. And I asked the question, what kind of energy, even though she may not be saying it, what kind of energy is she bringing to that onboarding process? Because ultimately, these people were heading out the door six months after they were coming in the door. And so something clearly energetically was off. So I, before we leave this point, contagion is one thing in your diction. But what about energetically as a leader? How do you protect that energy? How do you emit the right energy? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, for me, it comes down to having the right mindset. And then you back it up and say, well, how do you get the right mindset when everything that you've just said, we're busy, we're, we're, we've got pressures on us. It's, it's about how do you start your, your day? What is your morning routine? So for me, it is um, meditation, it's reading, it's journaling, it's working out. And then as I'm driving into work, I am in a much better frame because I have the intention to do the best that I can do. And so for me, my, my motto this year in 2022 was around my success will be about building different relationships and deeper relationships. And my friend said, oh, you've got to have more, more goals than that. And I said, I do. But for me, the most important thing I'm going to do this year is building relationships. And the only way I can do that is to get my mind right is when I'm interacting with people. So mm -hmm. I, I would sum it up by saying, have your morning routine and your intention set before you get in your car or you get on the Zoom call. Yeah, so, so, so important. I think that one of the common things that comes up with women across many verticals that I'm in front of throughout the week is how do I put self-care first? I put my employees first, I put my kids first, I put my husband first, and my own self-care falls to the back burner. And so then as what's on the back end of that resentment, anger, um, sickness, disease. And so before we go on to your final point here about how to make curiosity a constant in business, how do we prioritize ourselves because that seems to be a fundamental challenge for so many women yeah and i wish there was an easy answer for it um but what you know just what i was saying about looking at your day and figuring out how you can carve out time so maybe that is at 4 a.m or 5 a.m um, and to say, this is going to be my time to do whatever it is that I, that I'm going to do for my own, my own care of that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I once heard this, uh, woman that worked for me, she was experiencing this, you know, the challenges of having young kids and the and work demands. And, um, she, so we, we, so we talked to your husband about it and see what, what, how he might think about this and how he might help. And so she came back the next day and she goes, well, I had the conversation mm -hmm. and I said to him, you know, um, you know, when are you going to start helping with childcare? When are you going to start helping cleaning the house? And, and he said, when you start letting me. Mm. So that was such an awakening of um, sometimes we need to say it's not going to be perfect Right. But that I can let people get I can let people help, if, if you will. And I'm not saying that's the case for everybody, but that was a really key lesson for me. And then another lesson, which I shared with you earlier, is when 
I was at Frito-Lay, you know, I was in my late twenties and young children, big job, just trying to figure out how to keep it all together. And this vice president came in from Dallas and I got up the courage to say, you know, you're a mom, you're a wife. How do you do this? And mm -hmm. she said two words, get help. Mm -hmm. And, you know, get help means a lot of different things to, you know, to different people, but it, it so resonated with me and how I can begin to say, how can I delegate some of this or how can I ask for additional support? I just thought I was just, I just had to do it all myself. Yeah. And I began to have this realization of I need to, I needed to be able to give a little bit as well and make some adjustments. And some women are really seeking permission. So much are seeking permission to be able to ask for help. That's the irony of it all. And maybe that permission needs to come from yourself. I see some questions starting to come in here, Deborah. So let's get to our last point, which is how to make curiosity a constant in business. How do you make this the status quo? Oh, I think one way to do that is make it a part of your values. So at Humana, curiosity is one of our values. So we honor it, we encourage it, we role model it, um, you know, the, the ability to ask questions, to stay open to questions. Um, that, that is one way is to hardwire it into your values. Yeah. Um, Lana Sanderson is joining us. She says that curiosity builds creativity for me, for sure. She says that women need solitude in order to find the true essence of themselves again. Um, some of that curiosity truly does come in our relation to ourselves. I think Lana brings up a great point. Um, part of leadership is also allowing our own voices to be able to have time to bubble up, which is why I'm such a big fan of going away on trips, because on a plane, nobody can WhatsApp you and say, hey, <laughs> I need this. So I wonder if you could speak to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely in, in alignment with that. Um, you know, I talked about my own morning routine, um, but it. It, it certainly is, is giving space to yourself to be curious about yourself. You know, what is it that's, these are the questions I ask myself. What is it that's working? What is it that's not working? You know, what is, because I always believe I'm the creator of my life. I'm, you know, whatever is going on, I am the creator of it. If I have a jammed schedule or I've overcommitted, wait, you, you can re redo this if you will. So it's about um, asking your, being curious about yourself and asking yourself questions and I think one of the most powerful things that we can do is journal. Mm -hmm. So you know, write the question and then meditate, kind of see what comes up and begin to write that. Um, I was I recently moved and in my move, I found my seventh grade diary. I mean, this is how much stuff I have kept. And I was just so fascinated by the questions I was asking myself, you know, as a 12 year old in, in the seventh grade. Now, they were very simple questions, if you will. But it was it's been very powerful for me to ask myself questions. And you um, on one of your podcasts, you talked about the the BS audit. Yes. And yeah. The bullshit yeah. audit is, is something that I learned from Ryan Serhant. Um, he's somebody who's on one of those million dollar listing New York shows. He's a real estate broker. And he talks about the bullshit audit, which is, you know, when you are maybe thinking about the next level in your career. And Lana, Sudeshna, Amy, I don't know if you're thinking about the next level of your career, but when you are, it's important to understand the impression that you make when you first walk into a room. And the only way you're going to know that is by asking people whom you've made an impression on. Now, the idea is to go to six people in your life that are not people pleasers, that are not yes people, but the people that are going to honestly tell you that maybe that you hunch and, and you know, your shoulders are too forward and you're trying to make yourself small as you walk in the room. Or maybe you chew gum or maybe that you, you know, use a lot of filler words. I don't know. But that bullshit audit is getting curious about the impression that you make when you walk into a room. Room. And this is a really, it's a big growth moment. It's not an opportunity to get defensive. Some of the top Olympic athletes in the world seek feedback because they see that as a moment of growth for them, not as something that's going to tamp them down. Yes. And, um, you know, what occurs to me when I heard that podcast was also doing a BS audit on yourself. Like, what are the things that I say to myself that aren't true? And there are times I catch myself, that's not true, right? Like, it, uh, of course, I'm not speaking out loud. I'm speaking in my head, but it's like, I'm doing my own audit. Now, certainly it's brilliant to get other people to weigh in on it, but we also have this very, we can have very negative um, self talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, what also occurred to me, the, the quote that I'd given earlier, and his name is uh, Charlie Jones. He also said, no one is a failure until you blame someone else. Mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, to be able to take responsibility for your own thoughts, your own behavior and say, I can do better or I can do different. Yeah. I like to do the Katie Byron's uh, series of questions, which is, you know, I, I, let's say I, you know, I failed at something and now the script running through my head is I'm a failure. Well, okay, write that down. And the first question is, is that true? Well, that's not true. But is this absolutely true? You know, this is the second question. And then who would you be without this thought uh, is the line of questioning that she asked. So I find that that's always helpful when I'm go spiraling down a rabbit hole that I don't need to be going down. Yeah, I particularly love the one who would you be without this thought? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Especially if it's in the past, something has happened in the past. There's, there's no change in that. That's, it's just, it's just keep moving. Right? Yeah. And so much of us, uh, Amy, Sudeshna, Lana, if you have a question, please put it in the chat and I'll ask it to Deborah. Deborah, the first question that I have here is from one of my members and she's asking, you know, she really feels a lot of guilt when um, it comes to work. She's a very ambitious woman, has no qualms about working all day long, but feels guilt when she's in the office because she's not with her kids. And then when she's with her kids, she's feeling guilty that all the things that she, projects that she wanted to tackle aren't getting done. So how can we deploy curiosity in this instance um, and, and really try to make better of a situation that isn't going away anytime soon, especially if your kids are two and five? Yes. Well, one question, and then I have an idea, but one, one question to ask yourself is, um, am I feeling this guilt because of how I've been socialized in, in North America, right? Or, you know, in, in my culture, in my, in my home. Mm -hmm. And uh, is that still, am I feeling pressure from maybe people that aren't even pressuring me? Like, do you think, oh, my parents wouldn't like this or fill in the blank, if you will. And so it's really going to asking yourself where, where is the guilt coming from and, and um, where am I feeling it in my body? Um, mm -hmm. What I would recommend is um, doing um, what they're, they're called morning papers. So every morning getting up uh, early, you know, when the house is still quiet. And I know people are probably saying, oh, my gosh, I'm already exhausted because I have a five year old and a two year old. Trust mm -hmm. me, even just getting up 30 minutes earlier to spend time with yourself to journal um, I feel guilty. That's the thing. And then just begin to write three pages of what comes up when you, when you see that. Yeah. Um, now it's also about, think about this. If you had a, a, a sister or a dear friend that was feeling guilty because they were same scenario, right? Is what, what advice would you give your sister? How would you talk to your sister to encourage her to release the guilt? A mm -hmm. mm -hmm. couple ideas couple of ideas about how to get curious about that. I love morning pages. I actually have an app on my phone that's gamified it so that you rare, write a bare minimum of 350 words. And then the algorithm actually crunches it and says, here are the top themes that have come up in your content today. And it'll be anger or sadness or joy. Um, so it's great to see like, you know, kind of those themes that come up to really tell you where your head's at. I love that. And there's a, a quote says, I don't know what I think until I write it down. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they're really the, the power of writing and the power of writing um, to just get it out. Yeah. Lana says, what are some of the top three tasks that you pass on to your support group that makes your life balanced? Top three tasks that you share with your support group that makes your life balanced. I'm not sure if that question's for me or for you. Sounds like it's for you. Um, I'll take that, Lana. I mean, for balance, I will say that religiously on Sundays, I don't go to church because I'm a Hindu, but I do sit down and I look at my week. I look at my week and I really prioritize three things. Where's my self-care going to find its way daily, not weekly, daily? Where is that going to be found in? And if it's not it figured in, how do I re reverse engineer to make sure that's in? I also look at my top business goals and I see if any calls or any activities or dinners that are planned don't align with that goal that I have for the next 60, 90 days and I cancel them. Um, and then finally, I make sure that I am asking myself the question because my planner prompts me to, what am I excited about today? Um, I took the time to really think about my values and I would love to hear yours as well, Deborah. but my top two values are adventure and beauty. And I think for the longest time I, I was doing a lot of adventures with my women's leadership platform. I was doing leadership development through the element of adventure. 
but I wasn't actually saying that in my messaging. And I'm starting to do that because so much of the way that I do leadership development is through the element of adventure. And it's because it's one of my top values. So I would encourage anyone who feels out of alignment uh, with any element of their lives to think about their values and make that your North star when you're, when you're structuring your day. Deborah, what are your top values? Um, I think it would be learning and teaching. So I love to, to learn and go deep on something. And then I love to be able to put it in a way in which others can, I can share that uh, with others that they might benefit. So those would be my top two. Yeah. Deepthi says that she really likes the thought of journaling around where is the guilt coming from? Um, Deborah, I'm sure you've heard about shadow work, but shadow work is a series of prompts that you can ask yourself, you know, is this voice that's bubbling up right now mine? Is it my teachers? Is it my parents? You know, where does the authentic self meet the self that you present to the rest of the world and how can they merge and become one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is um, a writer that I adore. His name is Robert Green. And mm -hmm. uh, he just recently wrote a book um, and it's about being human and it's about our frailties and it's about how we come into this world, um, you know, wired in a way where we... Um, it's about survival. And um, so it's, it's, it's around, sometimes we behave in certain ways because we, we think that we're, we're, we have to, we do have to survive, but we have behaviors that we don't sometimes recognize. Like we can see it easily in others. Like, why are they showing up in this meeting behaving in that way? Like, why would they be a jerk in this meeting? And it's one about really getting underneath, like, all right, what's really going on that would that would bring forth this this behavior? I highly recommend Robert Greene's work. It's 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 really phenomenal. You sound like you're a prolific reader. I know Deepthi Mittal reads like three books a week. She's trained herself to do that. What are some books that you are loving on the topic of curiosity right now? Oh, actually, I've got one right here. Uh, I'll just show it right there. This one is. Um, I think it's phenomenal uh, by Ian Leslie. He's uh, he's British. Um, what I love about that is because he has the science and the art of that. So that's that's what really appeals to me about that. Um, but there is so much out there right now around curiosity. Um, there's just you just go to YouTube. It's it's everywhere. Even a. a, a uh, Brene Brown. Am I saying that right? She has a, a podcast out that's around that. So. Um, you know, for those that are curious, that are listening in, they're going to go find it, right? So Lana says she would love a book on curiosity. Um, I'm actually studying a lot on the subconscious mind because so much of what we are operating from is stuff that d people just sort of drove by and dumped in there between the ages of seven and 35, That's right. That's right. right? And then we're just operating from a, a hardware a software that's running left unchecked and we don't actually stop to think about why am I always broke? Well, maybe somebody, you know, at some point chided you for wanting money at some point in your life. And maybe that's the script that you're operating from. Go ahead. Yeah. I think you're really onto something. You're probably familiar with Joe Dispenza then. Yes. Uh, you know, in, in terms of I'm listening to a book, I love audio because I can, I can walk and, and listen. Uh, but it's a book around, you know, forgetting to be who you are. Yeah. Right. It's like unwiring messages. Yeah. Unwiring messages that, you know, our parents or our teachers in the most loving way, you know, we picked up on messages. So, you know, I'm always going to be broke or money doesn't grow on trees. And it's about getting back to Byron Katie as well. Like, well, is this true? You know, who would I be without this thought? Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's really forcing the reader to question a lot of things, including like, where is it in our psyche that this thing that we're operating from was transplanted? And it could be way, way, way back. But this also goes back to like the shadow work. Like, who, who are we operating from a hardware system we built of our own? Or is it one that was you know, imposed upon us? That we have to be acting from this place because that's what's appropriate. And we've been socialized to believe. And what I, I love about his work is that it comes from a place of love, you know, loving yourself and then you can love others. And I think that's just really, really powerful. It's not about manifesting, you know, wealth or a promotion, although that's a part of it. But it really is about knowing, know, know thyself, mm -hmm. know thyself. Lana has a clarifying question. The book that you're reading, is it Curious by Ian Leslie, The Desire to Know and Why Your Future Depends on It? That's it. Yeah. All right. There you go, Lana. All right. Um, Deborah, I think that we have really 
done a comprehensive job on the topic of curiosity. Any last items that you'd want to leave this audience with on the topic of curiosity and how it feeds into their leadership? Yeah, I would say that um, those that are curious will always be in demand. So if you want to have a, you know, be a point of differentiation in terms of your leadership, being curious will will do that. I'll remind people that curiosity is a, you know, a, a, a state and not a trait. So be around people that are going to feed you in that way. Uh, so those would be my my two final points. Yeah. And Deborah and I are cooking up some ideas to host one of my signature mastermind dinners in Louisville, which is where she makes her home. And that is a very conversation, curiosity driven dinner where everybody throws uh, a challenge that they're currently having into the center and everybody else weighs in with possible solutions. So curiosity is going to be the order of the day, including some yummy food from down south. So if anyone wants to get in touch with you, Deborah, what's the best way for them to do it? Um, you can uh, just go to my website, uh, DebraClary.com. Is it Dr. Deborah Clary or just Deborah Clary? DebraClary.com. Okay, DebraClary.com. I'm going to put that for everyone's benefit here so everyone can see it. If you want to get in touch with Deborah and if you want to get in touch with me, you can always email me about my mastermind dinner, joya at joyadas.com. Deborah, you have a great day. Thank you. Fascinating conversation. Thank you.